Chapter 16 I entered the Pearl through the rear window and wandered around till I spotted Buster inspecting a roach motel in the hall. He looked up at me, grinning. You want to see dumb? These guys are supposed to be older in dirt, but you show them the corniest gag in the world and they always fall for it. What's with the case? I need a favor. Consider it done. Come on back to the office, he said, and we'll schmooze. Like I figure the day guy went up to the gym. You got a gym here? We got a couple of heavyweight dumbbells in room 28. They've been playing poker since Saturday night. Good luck to the day guy, I said. The office was small and crummy. A gray metal desk with an ancient computer, some dusty files, and a half-eaten roll on the afternoon's post. The single chair, done in cracked plastic with nasty stuffing, as gray as the desk, had been angled outward, as though the sitter had stared out the window and gnawed at his roll and looked out at his life passing by in a hurry, and left in a hurry to try to catch up. So you keep any telephone records? I asked him. You know, like the calls they've made from the rooms? Like from room 37? He nodded. Gotcha. Intelligent thinking. He leapt to the desk and attacked the computer. I sat on the blotter and licked off some butter and glanced at the post. Missing kitten valued at millions. Reward posted at 50k. Wiggum, New York. December 12th. The story broke around ten last night. The golden kitten named Louis d'Or, the first and only cat of his kind, was reported missing from Beaumont Farms. Algernon Beaumont reported the crime, revealing the kitten had disappeared, between 9 p.m. Friday and just before dawn, from the Beaumont nursery, right down the road from the Beaumont residence. Tracks from the tires of several vehicles rutted the road, which led to the notion of foul play. The hefty reward... Okay, I got it. Buster looked up at me, tapping the screen. I looked over his shoulder. Saturday evening at 9.57, he said. There's a call. It's a local number. And figure he made it at almost the instant he got to the room. And before any news of the kidnapping broke and before he'd known about the reward. And he'd called it again at the top of the morning. I stared at the number. Is that any help? It might be later, I said, if I'm right. Okay, what's the story? I pounded my tail on the open newspaper. That is. Buster looked down at it. Man, you're kidding. I saw it last night on the ten o'clock news. But it didn't occur to me. Well, why would it? That was the point about dying in black. A gold-plated kitten would catch a few eyes and the gig would be over. What else have you got to amaze and astound me? I told him the rest. That Peter Patter was Herman Hench with a record for poaching endangered species. That Slasher's Jimmy, our Mr. Mittens, had somehow or other been hired by G. Only hold it a second. Not that I doubt you. But how would this G know where Louis was? I looked up at the number on Buster's screen. A ten gets you twenty. It gets me to G. For a time he was silent, his blue eyes thoughtful, his brown face somber, his tail in a knot as he tapped with it rhythmically, beating the desk. So you're telling me G knew where Louis was because Hench must have called him? That's what I'd guess. Only, why would he call him? Wait, don't tell me. Again he was silent. He angled his head. Maybe because he'd kidnap the kitten for G? Or like, G was his customer? That's what I'd guess. But if G hired Hench, and if Hench had the kitten, then why hired Jimmy to steal him from Hench? That's a logical question. 
I said, and I don't have a logical answer. Like, maybe you're wrong? That's a logical answer. I lowered my head. Look, I hate to do downers, I said. While you're down, let me tell you the rest of it. Oi, he said. Right. I reported the story from Dr. Laura. He thought it over and scratched his chin. Mysterious stranger with stripes in his hair? He looked up at me darkly. Then everything else is completely irrelevant, isn't it, Sam? I mean, G and Jimmy and everyone else. But I'm figuring otherwise. Figuring how? I wriggled uncomfortably. Figuring... Look, it's like everything spins around Mr. G. Like the web to the spider, you know what I'm saying? Like G'd be the spider and everyone else in this cockeyed concoction is part of his web. Like including the stranger? I nodded. Yeah, but I don't know the answer. I started to rise. I'll go back to the office and play with the phone. Let me give you my number, he said. What you do is, you phone up the switchboard and press 2-0. -oh. And that's where I'll find you? In room 20? He nodded briefly. That's where I'll be. Or at least till tomorrow. The only ones in there are me and the silverfish. Man, they are fast. They race in the bathtub, you know. Got a couple of friends that come over, we bet on the race. You're welcome to stay, but I... Yeah, I gotta go. I rose from the paper. I'll give you a call, let you in on the upshot. You'd better, he said. I decided to leave by the lobby exit. The lobby was empty except for the dust that was floating like moonbeams on yesterday's air. When I got to the palm tree, I noticed the Rex, the improbable Wilmer, arranged on a couch and entirely lost in the depths of the times. The gigantic paper, completely open, sat like a tent on the top of his head, and his eyes peered out of it, casing the room. I crossed the lobby and sat down beside him and said, without color, So how's Mr. G? The Rex ignored me, pretending to read. I glanced at a palm tree and said, Where is he? His eyes crawled sideways. He muttered, Who? You heard me the first time, I said. Mr. G. He spat at me. Beat it. I growled in my throat. You got his number, I said. He gave me a message to call him. So why'd he do that? I don't know till I call him, I said. But maybe he misses your company. How about that? Like he wants me to find you. The Rex made a snort. His pale little face seemed to twist in a smile that had cynical knowledge that clashed with his youth. Oh, yeah, he misses me. Yeah, that's a fact. Last time I seen him, he shoots me with water and shows me his boot heel and tosses me out. I suppose you were trespassing. Yeah, what's that? That you'd entered illegally. Yeah, well, you're wrong. I've been living there legally right from the start. And then I just once, like on Saturday morning, I happened to chuck on his idiot rug, his exciting Siberian tiger rug, and it's out of the window and never come back. Siberian tiger? That's what he said. But you want my opinion. It looks like nothing that looks like a tiger. It don't got teeth and it smells like cinnamon. Cinnamon, eh? Well, supposing I call him, and just supposing he tells me to find you. So what should I say? You can tell him to forget it. You tell him I hope he has fun with his tiger. You tell him I'm through. I rose from the sofa. So what's his number? The Rex sped it off to me. Bingo, I said. 
It was, as I had figured, the local number that Hench had called twice from the phone in his room. So what's his address? I began, when Buster came out of the office and glanced at the couch. He tried it on over. He given you trouble? He jerked at Wilmer. I said, I don't know. I looked back at Wilmer, still under the times. Are you giving me trouble or G's address? Buster stood over him, looking large and yet not unfriendly. Wilmer looked out. If I say the address, he said, squinting at Buster, you let me stay here as long as I want? Buster looked doubtful. He groaned in his throat and then looked back at Wilmer. You got no home? Man, I got no life if I rat on the fatso. Buster looked gloomy, but nodded twice. You'll have to be careful and do what I tell you. I'll do what you tell me. He nodded. Fine. Then tell me this character's name and address. It's Casper Gutless, Wilmer said swiftly. He lives on 12th Street. 221. 